What is the connected universe and why is it so important in raising human consciousness? Hey, my name is Haroon Rabbani and you're watching Untangled Television and I'm with one of the world's most leading and maverick scientists and physicists, absolutely amazing, amazing guy, Nassim Haramein, all the way from the United States. Welcome Nassim Haramein, Director of Research for the Res Resonance Project Foundation. Welcome to the UK. Thank you. It's okay. great to be here. It's great to have you here again. Now, I've got to tell you this, right? 2009, I did my very first Consciousness Revolution show, which was listened to by, and still is, by people from five different continents. Not five people, but five different continents. Yes. A lot of people, right? Right. The very first interview I did was with Nassim Haramein. Now, this is the very first television interview we're doing, and it's for Untangled Television, and it's with Nassim again. So, clearly, you make a big difference you're a very important <laughs> how can i say milestone for my life so thank you for joining us oh my pleasure okay it's great to be a premiere again brilliant excellent so i've got a whole bunch of questions to ask but let's right now as we speak we've had a major tragedy in europe and the tragedy is the parisian bombing people have been left totally feeling disenfranchised um, a lot of people are upset clearly a lot of people are fearful and a lot of people are feeling totally disconnected how does this, I mean, what's wrong with the human condition? What's going on with the human condition that these things happen from a physicist's point of view? Well, I think it's a humanistic point of view more than a physicist's point of view. I mean, from the physics point of view, you know, I think um, there's a lack of awareness of the underlying connectivity that, you know, it's like, People have a hard time unifying and if they could just kind of expand their mind instead of like, you know, their family and maybe a little bit of their neighborhood being their reality to like being like, you know, the earth or the solar system or even the galaxy, you know, if you, if you, if you blow your perspective to the galactic level. Uh, all of a sudden, it'd be easy to think of the Earth as a unified humanity, mm -hmm. right? Like, all of a sudden, the lines that divide countries don't make sense anymore. Yeah. You know, if you're thinking of it from the galactic perspective, the Earth doesn't even show up, meaning it's so small. Like mm -hmm. the, the, even our solar system doesn't even show up. It's mm -hmm. so small. And so, you know, to think of that being divided is ridiculous. Yeah. And so I think... You know, getting that perspective so critical mm. to our evolution at this point to like, you know, get past the differences mm. and see the commonality in our in our journey together. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't want to go too deep into that because this is a conversation we can go on for hours and hours and whys and the wherefores. But the bottom line is we are all connected. We'll talk a bit more about the whole connection thing. So most people that I'm aware of um when they were at school they hated physics and maths and sciences <laughs> i know why I, I actually loved it but i know why i hated physics there's nothing to do with physics because i had a crap teacher so <laughs> in your view how should physics math sciences how should they be taught perhaps in the future if at least not now but perhaps in the future um i think that uh it would really be good if physicists were brought um, to experience the physics that they're learning a little more, you know, um, you know, be in nature more, mm -hmm. be out there in nature, experiencing it, mm -hmm. you know, going canoeing on the lake and like checking out the fluid dynamics every time you put the pedal in mm -hmm. and you know, how much thrust are you able to produce from, you know, the paddle and, you know, all this stuff would be, you know, kids would be excited. To learn physics yep. if it was taught that way if it was taught in direct relations to f to nature mm. but if if, they, if they're sitting in a classroom and they're solving the, all these equations they don't really know why mm -hmm. and why does it matter in their life um, it's really hard to get excited about yep. physics and then there's other difficulties that that emerge um, like it's incredible when you look at the statistics of dropouts 
in the physics programs mm -hmm. in the first years of university it's like extremely high mm -hmm. and I think that part of it is that it's counterintuitive and it's and it's counterintuitive the way it is right now because uh, and that's my belief it's largely incorrect right. meaning this it's incomplete it's like the interpretations are not quite correct mm -hmm. and people sense that mm -hmm. And people sense I, mean, I don't know how many um, students I've met that either dropped out or were on the verge of dropping mm -hmm. out just because they felt like it just doesn't make sense yeah. and I don't want to spend my life working on something that doesn't make sense yeah. and um, so I think it's really time to really re-examine some of the fundamental principles and axioms that are the base of the physics we teach today so here's the question, okay, you're on the cutting edge of research. How can you convince physics professors, people who have written textbooks for, and, and they've been working in the field of physics for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, how do you convince them that what they've been teaching is wrong? I mean, and, and how do you get them on board? It is extremely difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's not a given that I will succeed. <laughs> um, you know, I think that part of it is that it's not just me convincing them. It's that the world is advancing and we're getting better and better techniques of measurements, uh, you know, better, better data from astrophysical bodies that are actually kind of leading the way mm -hmm. to a place that you know I may have come to earlier mm -hmm. and so it, it's becoming easier because there's supporting data mm -hmm. like for instance I wrote a very challenging theory mm -hmm. um, a holographic mass theory uh, for gravity at the quantum level that challenges a lot of the concepts that are already there. Mm -hmm. However, my theory predicted a very precise radius for the nuclear of an atom, mm -hmm. the mass of the atom, what makes up matter in our universe. And so it's an important piece of information. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I predict it, it predicted it very precisely. And, uh, and then an experiment uh, in Switzerland was able to measure that radius more precisely than ever. And my number is extremely accurate. Actually, I'm inside the margin of error of their experiment, where the standard model is off by 4%. And so, you know, these kind of things make a difference in our, you know, capacity to actually bring the information out. These are the kind of moments in history where a theory gets you know, even if it's very controversial, gets supported by so much data that eventually people start to pay attention. Right. You know, so wow. it takes time. It takes time. So you've clearly been inspired by amazing physicists and scientists when you were younger. So I'm really aiming this at the younger, younger people who want to really study and be, become a revolutionary scientist like yourself. Who are the luminaries who inspired you? I mean, people like, I don't know, for example, who's Tesla, for example, who, who, who are the big people who really got you thinking and got you wanting to really explore a lot more? Well, certainly Einstein was. Yeah. I'm sure that most people that are in science are inspired by Einstein. But, uh, but mostly, not necessarily what he wrote in physics, but Einstein's way of being. Right. You know, his philosophy, his understanding of nature, his, you know, his internal... Um, relationship uh -huh. with the universe right. uh, that was what really inspired me because right. Einstein was um, somebody that was really visual he could he could look at things and see through things in some ways mm -hmm. to see the mechanics behind it mm -hmm. so that was inspiring to me uh, Buckminster Fuller was another one um, Walter Russell was another one, more esoteric, but right. still very incredible thinkers, uh, way ahead of their time, uh -huh. still ahead of, of today's time. Um, and, uh, you know, as well, 
um, some of the Eastern philosophies mm -hmm. were inspiring to me. I learned to meditate when I was 11. And right. So I, I had a sense that like, there's an internal world and there's an external world. Mm -hmm. And the two are in relationship to each other. Yes. And, and funny enough, some, you know, 40 years later, the equations reflect those thoughts right, and right. give the correct answer. Um, which is basically a relationship between the information that's inside the system and the information that's outside the system, creating an event horizon, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and, uh, and that's the energy level that we see. That's, that's what we call mass. You know, when I interviewed you on radio uh, way back, uh, a few years back now, you said something to me which just blew my mind away, which was, if I, if I heard correctly, it is the space between the matter which is the mind of God. Can you share with our viewers what you what you said to me about, I mean, you can't mind, I remember word for word, mm -hmm. but what is the mind of God? Well, it's just that, um, you see, um, we, th we tend to think, you know, if we're gonna think about God, we, th we tend to think of something that's way out there, yeah. like looking down on us or something, you know, that's not in our direct, you know environment mm -hmm. right i but from what i found and certainly when you when you read the scriptures from many many different cultures around the world it doesn't describe it that way this it describes god typically as something that's everywhere that's in everything that's omni omniscient and omnipotent and so on yes and so uh you know when i was writing the physics uh, that i write and i i was discovering uh that that uh, quantum theory actually, quantum field theory, predicts that space is not empty, that it's full of energy. Mm -hmm. And that that energy can be described in terms of information. Um, it started to occur to me like, wow, that sounds a lot like, you know, what we would call God. Like that, like, that there's a field of information that's interacting with everything, mm -hmm. that, that's, that knows where everything is and where, what everything is doing. Mm -hmm. And that's constantly interacting with with every point in space. Um, you know, I start to realize, wait a minute, maybe the material world mm -hmm. is a is a consequence of the energy in the space, yeah. and it, instead of um, the space being defined by matter, it's space that defines matter. So what I'm hearing, maybe it's my uh, subjective view here is so what you're saying is it's the space that defines the matter mm -hmm. so does that mean that when you have clarity of space then you have clarity of matter yeah um the, you could say that when the space is highly structured yes and very energetic there's a lot of information in it then matter is probably highly coherent and you know very energetic so um so then you start to think and that's a really good talk that you can start engineering the space and uh, to create effects that like gravitational effects or energy effects that that could totally transform your civilization and it's just a change of you see because when you look at matter you know we th we tend to think matter is so dense and mm -hmm. it's so kind of you know you can't penetrate it and it, you know it's it's very difficult to imagine that you know space is making that stuff mm -hmm. but when you actually look at the stuff mm -hmm. that we call matter it's made out of 99.9999999 percent space mm -hmm. so this mat matter world this material world is is only point zero 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 one of a percent of yep. something yep. and and that something is just a little electromagnetic fluctuation that makes it so that this electromagnetic fluctuation and this electromagnetic fluctuation are bouncing against each other and so they don't penetrate each yeah. other. So it seems, that, but, but basically I'm just experiencing different density of the space itself. Beautiful. So a lot of our viewers will be into the physical movement work, such as yoga, it's very popular, mm -hmm. uh, particularly.